Okay. Thank you, Margot. All right, thank you, Margot. And good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? I noticed that there's no title for my talk um, in the program. But um, yes, I think Margot was trying to uh, lead up to my, the title of my talk, which is Why a World with AI Needs More EQ. And E means emotional um, quotient, or basically emotional intelligence. Uh, so first off, I'd like to just say how much um, I appreciate being invited here uh, to speak at this conference. Um, hello to everyone here and also everybody who's watching live online. I want to thank Margot and Karen and Judy, the organizers of this conference, for inviting me to give a talk. Um, so it's always nice to come back to Stanford. I don't think she mentioned that I, re I earned every single one of my degrees in electrical engineering from Stanford University. So I actually feel most comfortable here wearing red. <laughs> So for those of you who aren't familiar with the rivalry between UC Berkeley and Stanford, we have a friendly uh, sporting uh, sports team rivalry. And, um, but really, it doesn't uh, translate to competition so much in academics. In fact, earlier today, I was meeting with um, the Dean of Engineering here at Stanford, Jennifer Widom, and we had a great chat about um, initial possibilities for collaboration between our colleges. All right, so today I just wanted to share with you, since I am actually not a data scientist, um, I wanted to first introduce a little bit about myself, how um, basically I'm related to maybe this AI revolution, and then talk about some of the reasons why I chose to step up and serve as Dean of Engineering, because I think there's some serious challenges ahead in a world where AI um, can actually you know, take over or uh, exceed human intelligence, and, why, uh, and what we're doing at Berkeley to ensure that AI, the outcomes are you know, going to be human compatible and um, benefiting the good of society. Okay, so it's telling you sort of my connection to AI. Um, this chart is a plot showing exponential growth over time, over a period of 120 years, um, how the, the technology for computing has advanced. Okay, so the, the vertical axis is the calculations per second per constant dollar, uh, constant thousand uh, dollars. I guess uh, appropriately, you know, um, I guess taking into account inflation. Uh, so we can see that this trend of exponential improvement in computing performance is a projected. We most people do expect it to continue to to uh, continue for at least another decade. And we can see that the, you know, the level of computational speed of a human brain eventually will be reached. And that's uh, estimated to be in about the middle of this century. Now, I actually was a student here in the 1980s through the early 1990s, and that's kind of really in the, in the, re, uh, the re regime where integrated circuits, you know, integrated circuit technology, Silicon Valley sort of um, coming onto the scene was really hot, and that's why I ended up majoring in electrical engineering. Now, I moved over to Berkeley um, after I graduated, a few years after I graduated, and you, know, you might already know today that the computing devices today, these computer chips that are in all of the electronic devices, they're the brains of your computers, your laptops, you know, in the cloud um, servers, but also in your mobile devices. Um, those devices comprise, are, are highly complex. A single chip of silicon can contain over a billion transistors, up to 10 billion transistors. And so a whole system, ecosystem, of how to design these uh, new chips. Every, so every year you have a new product that can, uh, can um, do more. And, and basically the industry has sort of um, segmented itself into different layers of abstraction. So I've re represented this in, in terms of a stack of um, information technology um, stack. And so I just wanted to point out you know, that in academia we've actually contributed a lot to the AI enable to enabling the AI revolution today, you know, when I was a student here in the 80s, I took a course on artificial intelligence. But the computing technology was not yet advanced enough to really realize the power, right, the, the full potential of AI. So over the last 20 plus years, computing technology has advanced. So now AI can be, you know, real time. There are all kinds of exciting applications of data science. So first of all, at Berkeley, these are just examples from Berkeley. Spice is a uh, stands for simulation program with integrated circuit emphasis. So basically, how do you design billion component systems and make sure that they work properly and you know, in, on time? Software is, is used to automate that, and that's SPICE. Uh, the reduced instruction set um, architecture for, for a microprocessor was developed at Berkeley, and 
basically this technology or this com computing architecture is used in mobile devices today. It's a lower power. Um, the operating systems, Unix, was uh, open source at Berkeley, the Berkeley Software Distribution Operating System, uh, formed the basis for operating systems used today, let's say in the Apple Mac um, operating system, and also in Microsoft Windows. Now, where do I come in? I'm at the bottom there. That's like the lower back, okay? It's not the tailbone. Um, but you know, at the bottom, we, we actually also have to have innovations in materials and the transistor designs, the little miniature electronic switches to operate at hi higher and higher speeds and also to be able to be miniaturized to atomic uh, dimensions. And so that's um, how I contribute to this stack. And so the FinFET is a new transistor design that's used in all leading edge microprocessors today. And most recently out of Berkeley, you, you probably are much more familiar with this than I am, you know, Spark, um, basically cluster computing um, framework to really uh, speed up data analytics. Okay, so basically um, academia has really contributed to innovations um, that are enabling AI today. And that's my connection. And we all envision that in the future, um, a lot of things will be automated. We'll have you know, in interconnected devices as well as people. Um, we'll have not only smart uh, transportation that we're starting to see come on the scene, but in, in manufacturing, smart factories, um, smart uh, in personalized medicine and, um, and healthcare, um, and, and so on. Right? So all the infrastructure can, can um, benefit from AI. So from you know, water distribution, energy distribution, transportation networks, and so on. So this is the vision of the future. And there are going to be significant impacts on society, not only benefiting us, you know, making our lives hopefully more pleasant, but it really is going to change the nature of the workplace, of the, the nature of jobs. Okay? So this is something that uh, people are, we're starting to talk about for uh, several years now. Okay? And so I'm just citing some work that was some reports from a few years ago. So if you look at this um, chart, it just lists the top trends that are going to impact business models. So we already see today new types of businesses enabled by um, e-commerce and so on and, and big data. Um, so there's no ar argument that mobile, the mobile internet, cloud, you know, big data technology is going to change the nature of jobs because a lot of work is going to be automated. Now, what's interesting is that if you look at the level of risk, there are various categories you can put job, every job into, uh, each job can be put into a category of how risky, how at risk is it of being eliminated due to automation. And so um, on this chart, women, the, per the per percentage of jobs held by women is shown in dark blue, and percentage of jobs held by men is in light blue. And the different sets of bars are going from the left, low risk of being re replaced or automated, and to the right is very high risk. So you can see that the jobs of the highest risk to be um, eliminated due to automation are dominated by women. Um, also, if you look at the low risk jobs, the, the, risks, the jobs that um, are at lowest risk of being replaced, um, the, what women earn in those jobs is much less than what men earn. Uh, these bars compare men and women um, average wages, median and, and mean, okay? Um, and of course, the tech industry will continue to grow. AI you know, enables a lot of transformation for all industries, so there will be a lot of jobs. But generally, the, um, the sectors of the job market that are going to be growing um, are dominated by men. So even though men will also lose jobs, um, but the, they won't lose as many. For every single 20 lost jobs for women, only one is projected to be gained, uh, one new STEM job is projected to be gained. And that's in stark comparison to only, uh, only four lost jobs for every STEM job gained for men. All right, so I think everybody's aware, everybody in the audience today probably is aware that um, you know, men uh, dominate in terms of the workplace, uh, the percentage of workers. Um, for the left two bars show computing men, the taller bar, and then computing women. And then also the situation is probably even more disparate for engineering. And the different colors represent different race, race and ethnic, ethnicities. All right, so first of all, women, um, there are not as many women working in high tech today, in either computing or engineering. Um, so let's say roughly 25% of jobs held, technical jobs held today are held by women. But what's more disturbing is at the bottom of this 
slide showing that um, for science, engineering, and technology jobs, uh, more than half, or almost half, or more than half of the women who start actually within 10 or 10 years or so um, move out of those jobs. And they usually move into some, a lot of them move, about half of them move into some different type of job and uh, like out, out of technology altogether, okay? Or maybe starting their own company. All right, so this basically, these are the problems, right? So low representation, high attrition. And I've talked to a lot of women who, grad, uh, alumni, and asked them, well, why did you end up leaving the tech uh, track? Why did you end up going into whatever, HR or sales marketing and so on? And very often the, the answer is that they didn't see a career path for moving upward, like moving to higher levels of management or you know, to executive management or you know, being CEO and so on. So this chart is um, published by McKinsey and Company. They do a, a nice uh, report every year on women in technology. So it shows that sort of the percentage of women in light blue at the bottom um, that occupy jobs at the entry level and going to the right, that's higher and higher levels of management. So what you see here is attrition um, in, uh, in levels of women. So as you go higher and higher up in layers of management, the percentage of women is dropping um, fast. And it's even worse for women of color. So this is an issue of intersectionality. So those are issues. Um, okay, so first of all, like, is that a problem? <laughs> I hope that people know that it is, but just a couple of examples. Um, the second one I'll show here probably is mo most uh, relatable to some of the researchers here. But a common example I talk about with uh, young girls is the, the, ish, the, the example of um, airbag you know, systems in, used in cars to keep people safe in case of an accident. So this is a, a dummy that's used for testing airbag deployment systems in automobiles. And uh, the very first, actually for the longest time, the dummies were sized and weighted uh, based on a male anatomy. So even though uh, airbag systems were actually mandatory starting in the 90s, it wasn't until the year 2010 that the US Department of Transportation required that car manufacturers use dummies that were weighted and sized more like women as part of their, you know, in, in their testing to, to develop their airbag deployment systems. And, and basically, car manufacturers have found that generally, yes, the, uh, the women are about more than 50% li more likely to get injured in a car accident where, where the airbag is deploying because, first of all, we're generally sh shorter and the airbag might hit our head or neck. And also our neck, you know, our anatomy, we are not, we don't have as muscular, um, like, you know, neck and, and the strong spinal sort of support. So this is an example, and, and people, researchers who've studied this do admit, well, it's probably because the men, the, these systems were designed by engineering teams that weren't diverse enough and didn't think about, you know, that maybe half the passengers in cars are, are female, right? Not all sized and weighted like men. Okay, so this might be closer to home. So voice recognition systems. So it turns out that um, voice recognition systems, I, I didn't, uh, recognize this, um, actually are, is, uh, yeah, voice, in a, voice AI is, is going to become, a, uh, projected to become like an $80 billion business within the next couple of years. And Google reports that almost 50% of all queries today are by, by voice, okay? And they claim that they have a 95% accuracy um, rate. So the question is accuracy for what kinds of people? Um, so the very first voice recognition systems um, only recognize male voices. And interestingly, this is also the case for automobile manufacturers. You know, today we, we have voice recognition systems in the cars, right? We talk to the cars. And um, automakers have admitted for years that their speech recognition system doesn't work well for women. And the recommended remedy, do you know what the recommended re remedy is? Yeah, speak more like a man. That's obviously, that's, this is what VPs have said, right? Women should be taught to speak louder, direct their voices towards the microphone. Same, yeah, same for people who, who have, you know, are not native English speakers and so on. So this shows, these are just examples of lack of empathy of the, the managers, the, the engineers who design these systems that are meant 
Of course, not only for men, right? If you want to make money, you have to have a product that works for both men and women. All right. So I think it's pretty clear. It should be obvious. Di diverse teams or organizations, really, because they comprise a wider range of viewpoints and skills, that leads to greater collective intelligence. So these issues, lives literally were lost you know, with the airbag deployment systems. This is, might be just an inconvenience, but imagine um, that today, um, speak recognition is used like for inter interviewing people, like for immigration, um, job hiring, and so on. And imagine the kind of bias, if there's a bias against women and minorities, what kinds of decisions could you know, affect people's lives if these voice recognition systems are not you know, designed to work for all people. And we should just recognize that um, there are more dimensions of diversity than gender and um, race and ethnicity, you know, inner dimensions as well as outer dimensions. This is a really nice quote from uh, Dr. France Cordova. She's the director of the National Science Foundation, um, just stating that uh, what we hope is obvious. Diversity of thought, perspective, and experience is essential for excellence in research and innovation in science and engineering. And uh, for the people, the executives who need to be further convinced, if we look at um, companies on the left who are in the, up, the first quartile of, in terms of gender diversity, first quartile in their, in, in among all businesses, um, they have a higher likelihood of financial performance, which is above the industry uh, median. Okay, so compared to if your company is in the lowest quartile in terms of gender diversity. And the difference is even greater if you have, uh, in terms of uh, ethnic diversity. So diversity makes sense business-wise. And, and so companies should be motivated to uh, foster diversity in their workforce. So that's the, the, the situation, the challenge. Um, and that's what, one reason why I decided to come, uh, become dean, because I wanted to do some things to try to, to counteract this and to ensure that as the pace of technology advancement accelerates, people are not left behind. The digital divide does not grow. Now, the question is, okay, what is the root cause of this, of this disparity, the gender gap? Well, I think there are a lot of um, reasons. One could be just outright discrimination, but there are also subtle reasons. So unconscious bias is one. So this is attitudes or stereotypes that really affect our actions, bottom line, right, and decisions in an unconscious manner. So how many of you have, are aware of the Harvard Implicit Association Test? This is great. So it's a free test online. Um, I usually have some of my students when I teach take this test just to increase awareness of you know, hidden biases. So this chart here just shows of the people who've taken this Implicit Association Test online for free, um, to see if they have implicitly some association between gender and career, the ma majority of them do have some uh, automatic subconscious Im uh, association of males with careers and females with um, family. So we really should check our bias in order to address it, right, to try to counteract it. So this is a nice um, example of a study um, that was done I guess the New York Times, what they did was they sent email to a, a couple of thousand, 2,500 2, professors at hundreds of universities. Just an inquiry, can, you, can I have a meeting? I'm interested to be your PhD student. And they changed the name and, and from the name you can change, you can imply gender and race and so on. And it was clear that white males, if your name sounded like a white, you were a white male, you were far more likely to receive a response. Just a, other, a couple of other really quick examples. A lot of us choose people in our research groups or to hire into our companies based on first, first pass would be looking at your CV, right, your resume. And so this study was done with uh, 200, over 250 professors in physics and biology at eight large public universities. They each evaluated eight CVs for postdoc positions. And the only thing that was different in their, what they did was they changed the, the people who conducted the study changed the names, only the names, nothing else to sort of imply if somebody was female or African American or, you know, and so on. So the results showed that for the exact same CVs, in general, the males uh, were rated to have a higher level of competence. That's a dark blue bar on the left, uh, compared to women, which is the gray. In terms of higher ability, again, women, uh, men, even though it's the exact same CV, um, were deemed to be more hireable. It's kind of nice that women seem to be more likable but that doesn't help you get a job, right? 
Um, and then looking at race, race and ethnicity, um, again, uh, not surprisingly, uh, Latinx and blacks uh, did not fare as well, um, even though the CVs were identical, right? So there's obviously some bias, implicit bias. How about letters of recommendation? Sometimes we ask for a recommendation. We don't base our decisions for hiring based only on CVs. Uh, letters of recommendation, a separate study analyzed 300 levels, uh, letters of recommendation for medical faculty at a large US medical school. They found, and this is great data, you know, text analytics can do this very um, quickly. Male candidates generally are, are more often described as researchers and professionals, successful and having innate ability. And more often female candidates were described as teachers and students, very nurturing, working hard to get to where they are. Um, and then looking for key adjectives, like when we hire faculty, when we want to know that they will have the potential to become a star, you know, or what is their, their claim to fame, their home run. Uh, it, it turns out these standout adjectives, um, the data shows uh, from 886 letters that are much more often used for male versus female candidates. So there's some, um, you know, bias. So you should keep that in mind when you're looking at CVs and letters of recommendation or when you're writing letters of recommendation. So the question is, how do we solve this problem? Well, first of all, we need to increase our own awareness, okay? Um, because of time, I'm gonna skip this. So what, now I'm gonna talk about what we're doing at Berkeley. So my associate dean for um, students has developed this new course. I know that you, I don't expect you to read this, but basically it's Engineering One. We offer to all students, but freshmen especially, Engineering Your Life. And uh, some of the modules in this course are uh, tools for personal leadership. So basically reflecting on your own personal life story, you know, bringing, basically understanding yourself. And the next module is tools for self-discovery and knowledge mastery. And then tools for diversity and teamwork, tools for social, societal service, and then personal leadership plans. So this is something, um, it's been a really successful course. The students really appreciate it. Um, so that's one thing, sort of increasing awareness. Um, so we don't have bias, so we can hire more diverse people into our organizations. But diversity is not only what's important. If we don't include those people, if those people don't feel like they belong, they can't contribute to the full potential, and our teams therefore can't reach our full potential. And we have to also recognize that people come from different backgrounds and experiences so that equal equity is not the same as equality, right? People come from different, have different abilities and so on. If we want people to participate equally, we have to take that into account to achieve, to truly achieve equity um, and inclusion. So at Berkeley, another thing we've done, and there's a website here, um, we have started a series of uh, workshops to empower our engineering students, staff, and faculty to be agents of change, positive change. Um, and so what we have is engaging, you know, interactive workshops to have people practice, learn about and practice skills for, um, well, so first of all, increasing awareness of our personal biases, but how to interrupt exclusionary behaviors and how to advance equity and inclusion, okay? So, so far we've taught, talked about creating inclusive classrooms, how to have fair faculty searches, and how do we grade for equity. And then finally, uh, oh, so those of you who are not at Berkeley, you can always, also benefit from another resource. We have uh, an engineering library and a collection of books and other uh, published articles that talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it, we have an online version. So all of these re resources are available online. I encourage you to check that out. This is a good book, Invisible Women, and that's like re relevant to data. This shows how big data, um, basically if it doesn't, if you don't tag it men or women, it will just automatically assume it's you know, male, associated with male. Finally, as in terms of agents of change, we can incentivize companies to actually pay attention to data, look at the, the diversity of their workforce. And so I'd like to encourage you all to, to visit this website. We have a corporate diversity and inclusion survey that um, have, we have various companies who want to recruit our students come and fill out a survey to see if they track diversity metrics, what they do to foster equity and inclusion. This is a resource for students who are trying to decide which companies to work for. So I'd ex encourage you to look at that as a resource as well. So I'd like to close by thanking um, the people with whom I've worked for the last more than five years to come up to speed on this issue and to find solutions from um, not only from the College of Engineering but from the Women in Technology Initiative at University of California, 
basically, this initiative is really trying to increase the persistence and success of women in tech fields. And I want to invite you all, if you have, are not aware of it, we have a symposium this Friday at Berkeley um, about cybersecurity, featuring leading women in the cybersecurity field and a lot of interesting panel discussions. And we'll give some awards to recognize contributions of women to cybersecurity. So in closing, I know Margo is going to give me the hook. Um, <laughs> so women in technology initiatives. So as a professor, you know, I have a chance to give a lot of talks like this. So I'd just like to share with you, you know, we have such amazing students, and, you know, here at Stanford and at Berkeley, and they are inspiration for the faculty. So one of the students that I talked, um, gave a talk to last semester sent me an email last semester saying, I was attending a lecture with a neuroscientist who claimed that the male brain is better at working with deep technology than the female brain. And that was one of the reasons that men currently dominate engineering. And so she asked me, well, what did I think of that? And so on. So what I ended up doing was sending her a very long email to explain you know, about the, um, how the brain is plastic and how it's shaped, you know, our abilities are shaped by our experiences and so on. And so what she, she responded to me saying, you know, I've, I printed out your, your um, message and I keep it like next to my desk and I look at it whenever I you know, feel like I don't belong. <laughs> And I thought it was just really cool because uh, what she did was she ended up adding additional reasons why she should persist in engineering. And what I like the most is that it's like because you are not alone. And so I think everybody here, this is proof positive, this conference is proof that we are, we women, girls are not alone. And I'd like to thank you for all you're doing um, for to advance the field of technology, you know, data science and so on toward a better future for all of us. And uh, thank you for your kind attention this afternoon. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Yeah.